So good afternoon. Uh, once again, my name is Boon Hui Tan. I'm the Vice President for Global Artistic Programs and Director of the Asia Society Museum. It's so great that all of you all stuck it out. Uh, and the sessions are really so wonderful and informative and we have such illuminating speakers. It would be such a waste to miss any of them. And we are on to the last session. Uh, we want to try and make it uh, exciting and punchy uh, because we have reception and so on and people are going off to dinner. Um, so we return back in the last session uh, and the last panel to the original aim reference in the title, you know, this, this thing about US-China uh, forum, and we return to international collaboration in the development of talent, looking at, you know, with investments in culture, in art, and in media, uh, it really has become a kind of, as the earlier panels have put, a kind of really global sort of enterprise, moving not just across national borders, but across literally cultures and communities and binding people uh, together in, in, in very sort of interesting and new networks and new ways of collaborating. And everyone is also very excited, as you can see from the previous panel, that, you know, even though it may begin even as an economic investment, investments in culture are quite different because it has very strong societal impacts, it impacts societal networks, it changes communities, it creates, it's a very uh, strong in making places out of localities such that the places where investments are, like we can see with clearly with the um, uh, Dun Huang presentation become a different kind of place, uh, even though you know, e even though it's something that started historically. So here we are uh, at the very last panel, where our panelists will look at, you know, in a sense, the impact of uh, cultural investment on nurturing talent, on communities, on issues of cultural exchange and its ability to bind people together, as well as, of course, the benefits of international collaboration. So our first presenter is Kara Mates, uh Project Director, Moving Image Strategies, uh, International Programs at the Ford Foundation. And she works with Ford's 10 regional offices to design and implement a range of visual storytelling approaches tied to the foundation's international strategies. She's promised to be really punchy and uh, uh, exciting, just like an Avenger movie. So our first speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you um, to everybody for hosting this. This is a really wonderful audience, and I have my superpower bracelet on. Uh, so I promise to show some of my superpowers. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit today about some ideas that are so new we don't even have a PowerPoint for them. Um, and they involve the Ford Foundation, but they are actually based on work that I've done uh, in China, in Beijing, specifically when I was at Sundance Institute. Um, I have a background in nonfiction filmmaking, uh, in documentary, and I spent some years going to Beijing to work with an organization there called Cinex, uh, who is part of a global network of organizations that are actually um, working in their regions to, um, in the case of Cinex, improve uh, China by creative storytelling, specifically documentary. That's the mission of the organization. So I'm happy to say that I helped them design some labs and I worked with what I you know, thought of and what we called creative storytellers for some years, really hundreds of them uh, in China. So one thing that I'll say about China is that the uh, amount of talent um, raw storytelling talent is extraordinary and we've heard a lot in the last panel and probably before this um, about the ways in which commercial storytelling you know the big movie making business is obviously you know something that's growing and growing and growing in China but underneath that is a sort of nonprofit in the US a kind of non-profit or independent storytelling culture that I will say is not as recognized in China, uh, and there are many artists a part of it, uh, and it goes beyond non-fiction. There are, are independent artists and creative makers uh, and storytellers in China that are 
under-networked, under-recognized, and they don't have the kind of capacity supports that we want to see. So when I was spending time in China, uh, I was thinking how much it resembled um, the United States independent creative documentary movement 40 years ago. Um, and so that's kind of how we thought about the work that we were doing, is it was the very beginnings of thinking about how we could support authentic creative storytellers whose biggest wish, and it's a wish that is happening the world over, is to reflect somehow some of the realities in their lives that they're experiencing in a way that is accessible and of interest to audiences that goes beyond information, that is also storytelling. And so I brought all of this experience with me to Ford Foundation, where I've been for six years, working in nonfiction, running a, a global portfolio, what is now a global portfolio called Just Films. And through that work, I've actually now been asked to think about um, in the new Ford Foundation international program area, I've been asked to take on the challenge of thinking about how we can work with all 10 of Ford's regional offices and we've had an office in China since 1988. It's actually one of the newer offices, but it is 30 plus years old. Work with them on moving image storytelling strategies that amplify our issues through this kind of authentic storytelling that I'm talking about. And so I've actually had a number of extremely productive conversations with our China office. And we're bringing two principles into the conversation. One principle is, what if we thought of our artists as leaders? And what if we actually treated them the way that we treat leaders or potential leaders in other sectors? In other words, what if we supported them with fellowships? What if we gave them leadership training? What if we understood the power of mentorship inside their space? These are things typically independent artists don't have. We haven't built structures for that. Um, so that is one principle that we're bringing to bear on the design of this. And the second is, how do we center the voices and experiences of those who are most vulnerable in our societies? What is the way that we can use the storytelling capacities that we're developing and supporting and do exactly that so we understand what is happening to the people with least access to resources, raise up those stories so that they can be considered by the whole society. And so that is the, those are the goals that we're looking at with the new work that we're doing in China. Um, it is, as I say, so new, it's maybe five weeks old. Um, and we haven't even launched any of these projects, um, but what we are talking about are things like convenings, uh, demonstration projects, um, identifying and supporting this kind of infrastructure for creative visual storytellers. Hopefully those storytellers can move into the marketplace if they choose to, but our focus is on developing the voice um, and the perspective of those storytellers. Um, we will also, and I'll end with this because we'll have time on the panel, we're also looking at ways that we can take these perspectives in China and these artists in China and begin to understand how to travel them globally. We live in a time where capital moves very easily around the world, but humans cannot very often. But our artists and their ideas can carry some of that human experience across the sort of borders that our politics have made and our societies have made. And so in creating a global network of artists and artists exchange, we can try to do this so that we are also building the kinds of understandings of each other through our artists' expression um, that we simply don't have now and we need if we're to address the challenges, things like climate change, that all countries are now um, involved in talking about. And we believe artists should be at that solution-seeking table as well. So these are the kinds of things that we're talking about. It's a very new effort. Um, it's in an R&D phase right now. Ford has not done anything like this with uh, integrated across its 10 offices and using a cultural strategy. And so my biggest job is to use my bracelet and my superpower so that we don't take false steps and actually shut the door on the opportunity. We want to do it right. Um, so that in fact, not only will Ford follow through um, and its offices, but 
perhaps other donors, other foundations will see this also as a pathway to strengthening um, cultural workers, cultural experience, um, inclusive perspectives, and to create a different kind of global conversation. So that's what I wanted to bring to this audience, and I, and I thank all of you for listening. I hope that was punchy enough. <laughs> Thank you, Kara. And I'm sure there'll be tons of questions uh, in the session uh, later. Um, those of us who have Netflix, and I think most of us do, I'm sure you'll be familiar with uh, that incre this incredible documentary that our, our next uh, speakers, uh, Jeff Reichert and Chang Yiqian, the producers of American Factory, have done this incredible uh, sort of documentary about uh, the Fuyao uh, operations in Dayton, Ohio. And, and when I first saw it, uh, I mean, other than the, the sort of factual uh, strangeness of it, this, this idea, uh, it really seemed to be a kind of crystallization of this is the reality of the world today. This kind of, uh, in a sense, production networks, but also cultures, you know, stretching across uh, time and space to very unexpected uh, locations that you you thought you know would would still essentially be our grandparents' uh, sort of culture that that has changed and I'm reminded of uh, one of my colleagues in the Asia Society who actually went to this little border. Uh, town in Alabama where the biggest factory was a big Korean car uh, factory and it changed forever uh, the culture other than having uh, of course you know Korean fried chicken uh, being very important in the local restaurant scene but I think it just reminds us of in a sense how much has changed in the world that there is a kind of new reality whether we choose to confront it uh, with open minds or we, we get angry at it or we just simply ignore it. So I want to uh, hand over to, to Jeff and uh, Yi Qian, the producers of this incredible work. Um, thank you to Ms. Tsui Chow for your kind invitation. We are very glad to be part of this today. Yeah, and so we're going to talk a little bit about um, what we learned about making a film that was essentially, um, or maybe not essentially, but in some ways about the intersection of two cultures and having to sort of integrate our own culture with the, the team members from another culture to make that actually work. It actually, the film wouldn't really have been possible if we didn't have members from the team from China working with us. So before we begin, can I ask how many of you have seen American Factory? Can you raise your hands? Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So for those of who haven't seen the film, it's a documentary directed by um, Stephen Bogner and Julia Reichert about our former General Motors plant outside of Dayton, Ohio, and which was purchased by a Chinese billionaire and reopened as We Are Glass America. And in the early days of this endeavor, there was hope and optimism, but things didn't go exactly as planned. Um, the film is a close-up and an intimate look at what globalization looks like. So the, the film premiered at Sundance, and it's now streaming on Netflix. Pretty much everywhere, though not in China. Um, check it if you haven't. Um, so my path to working on the film is a bit unlikely. I grew up in China, in Beijing, and then I work at China Central Television, which is the public broadcaster. And then I work on a couple of co-productions with uh, international filmmakers, and I realized my, my real passion was independent documentaries. So I decided to quit my job in 2016, and then I went to um, ITVA, which is the largest independent documentary festival in the world in Amsterdam. And that year, American Factory was selected to pitch at the big central pitch forum. Um, and I saw the pitch, 
I just I was amazed by the story and I couldn't believe the access. So I approached Steve and Julia and they told me, oh, we were going to China the next month and we're looking for Chinese filmmakers. So I just uh, got on board of this crazy and fascinating journey. Um, just like the workers of Real Glass, I spent all my life in China and suddenly found myself on another continent working with a completely new team and in a different culture. How do we try to understand each other to be able to work together? At FUYAL, they try to introduce workers to America by organizing culture presentations for the Chinese workers. Yeah, so we'll show you a clip of one of those. Yeah. <笑>在美國這個地方就是似乎就是一個釋放的地方你只要是違法你隨心所欲你甚至拿總統開個玩笑都都沒人會把你怎麼樣是吧美國人的汽車寬寬大大的很舒適所以這也表現了美國的人這
right, Leon, I'm gonna go home and get me something to eat. I'll be oh, back down. Oh, okay, okay, no. That's to me too. So that, that is the edited version. That conversation went on for about 20 more minutes in real life. And they still never quite spelled Wheaties correctly between the two of them. Um, you know, it's an odd scene on the face of it, right, for a movie that is about a glass manufacturing facility. Um, we're not in a factory. Um, you know, there's no necessary indication of, like, who these guys are in relation to each other, except that one works there. But um, we realized after a while that it said something really important, something that we wanted to communicate in the course of the film. Um, it was an idea about things we have in common. And in some ways, this scene could be looked at as a scene about an inability to communicate. But I think there's another way to look at it, which is an idea of two guys who are blue-collar factory workers. Who they're, They come from very different backgrounds, but they're blue-collar workers. And they come together around a shared passion for fishing. And all they really want to do is try to communicate with each other, no matter how difficult it is. You know, so watching the, you know, being there, filming the scene as it's played out over the course of an afternoon was really, it was kind of a, it was a lovely thing watching them make missteps, succeed a little bit, make more missteps, and end the day as kind of odd friends. I think as soon as we started filming the, in a plant, we just saw that immediate connection, like natural um, connection among workers, um, especially on a factory floor where it's extremely physically demanding. Um, but over time, when the company needed to um, start turning a profit, things got pro um, got difficult. People got frustrated because of the differences um, in work styles and attitudes about work. We'll see, see a little of that in the next clip. <laughs> <笑>你放在城市 <啊>, <笑>我觉得最主要的还是相互就是更多的互相去体谅压力是很大确实是说白了我认为在这个地方美国的压力也大好几倍就有一个那边有一个人都睡不着好几天都睡不着都有很佩服美国人还能上两班了So what you're, what you're seeing between those two scenes is kind of um, the two poles um, at the kind of the opposite ends of the spectrum that we found amongst workers, both American and Chinese, in that factory. On the one hand, you have um, Li, who's come from China, and he's used to working six days a week, having mandatory overtime, sometimes being forced to come in seven days a week, um, not really understanding why now that he's in America that the Americans shouldn't have to adapt to the way that he's used to working in China. And on the other hand, you have Wang, who um, he's working the same kind of hours as Li, but also he's made more friends amongst the Americans, and he's the kind of person who's really trying to think through um, their struggles and the kinds of expectations that they had when they came into the factory. So a lot of this film was about creating juxtapositions that would get viewers to really reflect on their own biases and situations. 
um, this next clip comes from the end of the film, and we think it says something really powerful about the state of the global economy, but through the eyes of individual workers. Last Friday, I was terminated from Puya after two and a half years. Uh, the excuse given was I was too slow pulling up something on the computer. It took me about two or three minutes. It wasn't quick enough. I wouldn't take away the last two and a half years. I met a lot of good friends, and I learned a lot from the Chinese. GM afforded me a great life that was cut off when they closed the doors. We would never ever make that type of money again. Those days are over. So there's a, a kind of a key juxtaposition at the center of that clip. There's on the one hand, you have Wang, who is 38 years old. He's in his 20th year working at Fuyao. For him, the future seems really bright. He's really excited about being there. He thinks, um, he thinks he'll work at Fuyao forever. And on the other hand, you have Robert Allen, the African-American gentleman who you see at the end, who used to work at GM. And if you talk to him maybe 30, 35 years ago when he started there, he might have said kind of the same thing about his relationship to that company. You know, but for a while, we, when we were making the film, we only really had access to the perspective of the American workers. And so it was so crucial for folks like Yi Chen to come in and help us get things right and unpack those other perspectives. I mean, I didn't know a lot about China before starting to make this film. And we learned a ton and hoped that we could perhaps impart something about how we make documentaries here in the US to them. I think it was having this cross-cultural collaboration was a, a, a new wrinkle in making a film, which is always a really hard thing to do. But I think the collaboration made us all better documentarians at the end of the process. Yeah. Um, cultural influences our wills, our values, how we act and how we see the world. So when we work with people from a different culture, it helps to have some understanding of their perspective. But sometimes I feel we may, as a society, emphasize too much on how different our cultures are. We are just individuals and everyone is unique. Everyone, no matter what their background is, has different opinions, habits, and ways of life. And the biggest lesson I've learned from working on this project is have no preconceptions, have an open mind, always be ready and willing to embrace differences because they bring new and exciting perspectives. Thank you. So the small number of, very small number of special people who haven't seen the documentary, please do so. 
it's it's really wonderful. Yeah, everyone should 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 see that uh, in America right now. So our next speaker uh, is Dr. Daisy Yeo Wang, the deputy director of the Hong Kong Palace Museum, which is uh, being built right now, and Dr. Wang is responsible for the museum's exhibition, research, collection, publication, learning, and public engagement programs. That's a lot. So uh, I'm sure we're all dying to hear uh, about about this new uh, institution that is coming up, and it, it's really quite unique. Uh, um, a kind of enterprise, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions following. But Daisy, please. Thank you, Bu Hui, for your kind introduction, and also thank you, uh, Ms. Tui Chao and Jiu Ting, for putting together this wonderful and stimulating uh, forum. Um, I have to say that it is such a heartwarming experience for, for me to come back to Asia Society, a place uh, in the city that I would call my home, because 11 years ago, uh, with a uh, very generous uh, fellowship from the Getty um, Foundation. Um, I was um, able to spend uh, a very memorable year um, with Asia Society, learning all aspects of museum work, uh, from cleaning vitrine cases uh, before 10 o'clock when <laughs> visitors would visit, to uh, writing labels, writing catalogs, um, giving tours. Um, so I would say that it is um, my Asia Society experience that launched my museum career. Um, and after that, uh, I was uh, working for two American museums uh, as a curator of Chinese art and East Asian art for 10 years. Um, three months ago, um, I was um, invited to act as the deputy director of the new Hong Kong Palace Museum. So as um, Bong Hui kindly mentioned, this is a museum to be. Uh, it is under construction and is on schedule. Uh, we are going to open <laughs> in mid-2022. Uh, um, and uh, this is a museum um, that is dedicated to the promotion of Chinese art and culture and history, but also to promote the dialogue between Chinese culture and the world. So we are not only going to borrow um, a large amount of treasures from the Forbidden City, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but also we welcome all of you to come to talk to me to talk about the collaboration, to talk about traveling exhibitions, programs, all kinds of things. Um, but also I want to mention that um, we are also in the process of recruiting a huge number of curators, designers, and uh, educators. So if you're interested, please come and talk to me after this. Uh, the museum will have nine exhibition galleries with a total area of nearly um, 80,000 square feet. And it is also a part of the very exciting culture development in Asia. It's called West Kowloon Culture District that is located in the west tip of the Kowloon Peninsula. And this is a huge conglomeration of performing arts centers, including the recently opened Xichu Center, um, as well as uh, museums such as M Plus and Hong Kong Palace Museum. Well, um, the topic I was giving is about the importance of talents, the importance of training talents uh, in the cross-cultural context. Um, and I would say that um, after many years of working in America, um, I was thinking mainly about how to, how to network with Chinese colleagues. Now I'm shifting my focus to Asia. To me, the task is how do I work with uh, colleagues in America and other parts of the world? Um, so today, I really want to share with you some of the thoughts, and also I will welcome all of you to give me um, some advice and guidance. Well, I want to use a case to really share with you um, the importance of collaboration and the importance of uh, cross-cultural understanding, and particularly the importance of building people-to-people -people relationship. 
This is a project and, um, that is a three-way collaboration between the Smithsonian's Friends Sackler, my previous museum, the People's Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts, and the Palace Museum, known as the Forbidden City in Beijing. This is an exhibition uh, that is the first international exhibition that really look at women's presence uh, in the Forbidden City during the Qing Dynasty from the 17th century to the early years of the 20th century. And uh, the exhibition also featured an unprecedented number of treasures from the Forbidden City. Um, and it is a traveling exhibition, um, actually. It was in the United States for nine months. Um, debuted at the Peabody Essex Museum and traveled to Washington, D.C. to be shown at the um, National Museum of Asian Art on the National Mall called the Friends Sackler. Well, we talked about um, sort of cross-cultural storytelling. Here is how your American uh, world looking at exhibition, looking at the term power, female power, right? Looking, thinking about Me Too movement, think about what's going on in the political scene. But also on the Chinese side, when we actually launched the exhibition in America, many people came to me saying, wow, I actually am so fascinated by the story because there was a TV drama called the Yan Xi Gong Lue in China. And in fact, that was sort of the, you know, um, sort of the Chinese version of Downturn Abbey. I'm so interested in all these ladies. I said, well, this exhibition was in planning for four, you know, five years. You know, we were thinking ahead of the Yan Xi Gong Lue. Just showing you some of the installation shots, uh, many treasures that you can see. But also, I, I want to mention that in terms of how we communicate with American audience, well, treasure is definitely an angle, but we're very much focused on storytelling, particularly sort of the people relationship at the court. Um, the lady here is the beloved mother of the Qianlong Emperor, one of the greatest rulers on earth in the 18th century. And, um, you know, if you tell people's name, uh, you know, most Chinese emperors' names start with X, so people can, first of all, cannot pronounce it. But when I tell her story, I tell people that this is the world's um, most spoiled mother. So I, said, I said, why? So I told them, well, you know, she received from her son the largest birthday gift, that is the Summer Palace. How many of you have been to the Summer Palace? And also on the left is a gold hair stupa, which is a reliquary to hold her hair collected during her lifetime. And this wonderful object um, is made of gold and silver. It's the largest gold um, Pagoda uh, in the entire palace collection, it weighs 237 pounds. And it was a um, memo sort of memorial gift that Chen Long commissioned um, after his mother's death. Showing you our colleagues installing this giant object. But also, one of the largest objects um, in the show is this 15 feet tall. Uh, oil painting depicting Empress Dowager Cixi, the one of the most famous uh, female rulers probably in world history, de facto ruler of China for nearly 50 years. But this is also show sort of the people to people um, dialogue at the time. This was a gift that Empress Dowager Cixi commissioned uh, to uh, U.S. President uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Well, of course, we have endless treasure, but when you ask me, or if I can ask you, after you finish a big, big project, um, please ask yourself, what is the part you remember best? Or what is the part you enjoy best? To me, um, not the treasures, not the coverage in New York Times, is this, is the excitement um, of working together as a team is the friendship you build with all your colleagues. Despite the differences, despite all the tension, and this is um, the team. Um, who actually, um, we just finished uh, four weeks uh, living in the galleries, uh, just finished the installation. Um, well, a few thoughts to share with you. Um, for a large project like this, um, you know, of course, 
it is advisable that you have a contract with your partners. But sometimes we find that trust is more important than text in your contract. And previously, I was very much fo focusing on research, on looking at objects. But also what I learned after this is invest your time in building real relationship, long-term relationship. Well, this is a classic example. Um, on the left is my co-curator, Jen Stewart. And after three, four years of working together, um, we can finish each other's sentence. And we do presentation together like this. And we usually start by saying that we are Siamese twins. Um, another lesson we learned um, after doing many international projects is that um, Collaboration really should happen at the very level, every level. When you have a big team, they're not just curators or scholars, um, you need to mobilize your other team members, including education team, a digital team, because previously, you know, um, in terms of US-China museum exchanges, mainly is sort of Chinese treasures come to America and we package them, we present to an American audience, but we find out there are many, many new exciting areas for collaboration to happen. For example, we collaborate with Palace Museum on photography, on uh, filming. Um, there, there are many, many uh, interesting examples that how can we all work together. Well, um, I want to finish by um, sharing a few thoughts about, um, based on my own experience, that what kind of new uh, talents that Chinese museum would benefit um, for having. First of all, um, Chinese museum landscape is fast changing. Um, there's a whole generation of new museum curators and professionals are really um, changing the museum scene here. And what I find is really exciting is that when you talk to um, younger generation of people, they're so open-minded. They're not interested in what you do. They're interested in how you do things. They're interested in new models of collaboration. Um, and they're interested in having the best practices, not in American Museum, but worldwide. So they really have a global perspective. So I think that Chinese Museum will really benefit um, of having this kind of new leaders. Um, when, I, when I arrived um, in Hong Kong three months ago, um, I find this quite challenging for obvious reasons and also very exciting because I find there's a lot of room for growth and change in Hong Kong and mainland China. One of the things I, I actually brought to the museum is to make sure that the team will be more collaborative um, in many American museums, in many Asian museums, that when you start planning an exhibition at early stage, usually curators were the gods. They determine, you know, what do you borrow, what kind of ideas you want to communicate. But I want to bring some of the good examples in this country to share with my colleagues, saying that actually at the planning phase, you really need to engage design team because they are also creative. You also need to bring interpretation team because they can advocate for the audience, so make your academic ideas more accessible, more exciting to the average visitors. I'm also um, creating a new department specializing in exhibition planning and management so we can be more professional because I want this museum to be an exhibition-making machine. Um, and then another kind of talents I would like to have is people who can leverage resources and navigate culture differences in the local and global context. Just to give you an example, these are the criteria we are establishing for um, organizing and taking exhibitions at the Hong Kong Palace Museum. Very obvious, you know, it's not something new, but I also want to call your attention to something I actually used, um, read, that is, how do we create a museum that is relevant to Hong Kong, to its local context, to its local residents? Another one is that how do we enhance the museum ability to originate and travel exhibitions and partner with other museums and cultural institutions, both locally and internationally? Uh, what I'm saying is that we're not just going to take package show from other museums. We want to partner with other museums so we can co-organize and we can originate uh, exciting new ideas together, but also because of Hong Kong's strategic location, we want to develop opportunities and capacity to package 
great uh, shows from China and have an ability to tell compelling stories that are accessible to international audience. Well, this is my vision. Well, another type of talents um, I, I, I want to mention, particularly in the Asia context, is that um, I, I hope that our museums in the future will understand and prioritize the audience and the so-called software, which also Catherine mentioned very nicely. Well, if you have a fantastic building, you have many treasures. Well, you can be a very good museum. This is what a lot of Chinese museums are focusing. They tell you what is the square footage of their building, how much money they invested, how many treasures they have. But what I would argue that a great museum, you need people, mainly your audience. So we need to have better um, information, better knowledge about audience needs. Uh, we need to develop a uh, capacity to tell better stories, create a transformative experience inside and outside the museum. And this is something I think that um, Chinese museums will benefit greatly if they focus a little bit more on the software. Well. Um, Another type of talents that my museum desperately need is uh, people actually specializing in development work and fundraising and uh, patron cultivation work. Because in America, you can't take for granted, of course we raise money, we have fundraising department, and they're one of the biggest departments in the museum. But that is not true in many museums in Hong Kong, particularly um, in the past that really the highest concentration of museums are really actually government museum. But with M Plus, with Hong Kong Palace Museum, I think we have many opportunities to, to actually uh, fundraise and cultivate donors locally and internationally. Well, this gives you an idea about doing an exhibition such as Empresses of China's Forbidden City, what kind of development work we need, and this is what we aspire to do. Well, way forward, I will not repeat those things, but um, I want to share some points um, for American museum professionals to consider. One thing is I want to be very optimistic based on my experience is that Chinese museums are very eager. There's a big market and the market is diverse and changing, complex. So, you know, um, I would say you all have something to offer. Uh, be entrepreneurial, that's obvious. And also I think a lot of museums has aspiration to work with China, but I think one of the things they don't have is they lack strategic focus, meaning that you need to devote resources to put China as real focus, as a long-term focus. Um, another thing sometimes you encounter is that directors are really enthusiastic, but not, you know, uh, not other staff. So how do you educate and mobilize your staff to, to, to look at China, to work with China, to build a relationship is really important. But obviously, you have to rely on somebody or a lot of people who have knowledge of both sides. Well, I also translated in Chinese so my colleagues can see is that um, there are a lot of opportunities for Chinese museums, policymakers, and funders to help China, um, to help Chinese museums to create um, more exciting, more accessible, and more international projects. And also, it all comes down to how do we actually, actually produce talents. Um, one of the things I also want to mention is that a lot of um, projects um, in China that you see great impact, but sometimes one off, how can we be more strategic? How can we think long term? Um, and also that uh, as a host in American museums, I received, I helped a lot of Chinese museum professionals to come here and to study and to actually work with me in, in American museums. And I see that's kind of transformational experience for a lot of my colleagues. So I think that we need to encourage and support more Chinese colleagues to come and, you know, work on real projects here in America. Um, but also I hope that, um, that Chinese funders will change a little bit of the mentality, not just focus on training Chinese museum professionals here, but really think about how do you really, how do you actually engage um, international museum colleagues and let them be your uh, spokesperson, let them be your ambassador and to work for you. Um, and the last point I want to mention that is perhaps, you know, I'm looking at um, a lot of my colleagues here, fund potential funders, foundations. Um, I think that one of the biggest challenges for the lack of major, major exhibition, particularly Chinese art exhibitions in America, is that 
we do not have sufficient and sus sustainable large funding for those projects. For example, you know, to have a, a, an exhibition project like Empress's uh, project, uh, the budget is two to three million US dollars. Um, so we spent years and years to raise the money. But in fact, if, when we have dedicated funding, sustainable funding that we're gonna encourage both American and Chinese museums to look at those ambitious projects that are really gonna transform the field of Chinese art and really promote the appreciation and love for Chinese art. And my last slice, please add me to your WeChat account. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. Uh, and now uh, we move from the fine art and museum sector into the larger creative sector. And our next speaker is Xavier Thieu, uh, the Executive Creative Di Director of Condé Nast Group, uh, the creative agency, uh, the C CNX, uh, the creative agency of Condé Nast. He's a Singaporean based uh, in New York and had previously worked on many uh, sort of campaigns. And interestingly enough, he's also made five Emmy winning Super Bowl commercials for the NBC uh, Olympics. Uh, Xavier? Hello. Hello. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ben Hui. Thanks for having me here. So can you guys hear me? All right. I don't really have a PowerPoint slide, but I just want to share a little bit of my experience uh, working almost 11 years in the States. And uh, really, really interesting panel. I can't wait for the Q&A to start. but. I guess what I do for a living is actually really interesting because everything that was touched upon is what we are trying to do to help brands to uh, tell their stories in different ways. So I see myself as a very different storyteller compared to the rest of our panelists, but important as well because it's really stressful. Uh, as we all know, the growing economy of China and every brand wants to tap into that, uh, that space. It is more and more important for us to realize the importance of talent and cross-cultural collaboration because, I mean, I don't have to mention there's a lot of instances that uh, what I do is trying to protect a cultural code. That's how I see it as a, as a storyteller. Because the importance of brand having that kind of sensitivity and understand when you try to get into the market and try to market a product, it's very important for you to understand that there are certain things that you want to tell, but you have to be really sensitive about that. So, uh, so what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is to ensure that, is to uncover the brand truth, is to tell the brand story, brand story in the most truthful way possible, but also make sure that we are really sensitive to culture. I mean, I, I don't need to mention there was like, uh, last year there was a really big campaign that was launched in China that cost a brand billions of dollars just because it wasn't sensitive about uh, the way that they portray women in China. So what I'm trying to do as a creative director on a day-to-day -day basis is to try to make sure that stuff like that doesn't happen. So my experience here was really interesting. Um, what I do at Condé Nast, we basically, Condé Nast before uh, this year wasn't a global company. It was between US and international. So uh, this year we tried to combine the companies together and, 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 and become one truly global company so that we can service clients in different ways. But that means that as a global cultural company, we gotta be, be more sensitive and we gotta be more collaborative in that sense. We gotta hire people. And it's also more interesting because when you have people from all around the world, when you have uh, talents that we hire like myself, it basically makes ideas better. The, the most interesting thing as well is also technology forces us to collaborate because what we know here in America or, or brands who want to tell their stories in China is uh, the technology is just a completely different space in China. We have to respect that. We have to understand that. We have to know how, how to interact with people. So that itself brings the importance of really hiring talent and, and collaboration. And also culture, right? I mean, like I mentioned, uh, we got to, as I, as I usually I work with brands from Fortune, hundred companies. It's really important for us to have a global perspective, but be able to speak locally. I guess that is the most important thing. So that again will emphasize, uh, it's, it's really important for us to have that perspective and, and, and to have people who understand that. And also the last thing I think was really interesting for me to think about uh, the importance of cross uh, collaboration is production, because I guess a big part of my job is always trying to find different ways to make stuff. And these days is very different. Like back in the day, it's really simple, right? Advertising is very traditional. It's make, make a TV, do a couple of pre-nets, you put it on 
whatever media, and then that's it. But this, this day and age is really different because the way brands want to tell their story uh, sort of transcend into so many different forms, social, film, documentary. Like, for example, my friend uh, just made a film that was uh, that won the best documentary on, in Tribeca Film Festival. It's called Gay Chorus Deep South. He's actually a copywriting partner of mine a couple of years ago. But it was actually a brand film that was created by Airbnb. So these days, the lines between film, art, and advertising is starting to blur a lot. And I think uh, with that, I think we also have to think about creative ways for us to hire talent to tell that story or, uh, or think about production in different ways. Because, uh, I mean, honestly, if you want to produce something in the States, it's really expensive. And that is, some, that is a challenge that I face on a day-to-day basis, uh, which is really interesting as well. Because uh, how can we think about different ways to make things and also think about having different talents and collaboration that, that help mix our ideas? And, I think to me that's a very important piece because I just hate to see ideas die on a day-to-day basis. So I think that is one of the most important things uh, that, that we got to do. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ilya. As you can see, the business people move at a different speed. <laughs> And now we end, of course, we have to end with cultural entrepreneurship. And our final speaker, Daniel Chang, the founder of Lucky Rice and host of Lucky Chow, uh, has been a cultural entrepreneur who has invested the past quarter of a century in building brands across the creative industries, including art, media, fashion, and food. Uh, the company she founded, Lucky Rice, is a lifestyle brand that shines a spotlight on Asia culture through food and drink. And of course, in Asia, the way through a man and woman's heart is through their stomach. Uh, so, you know, you got it uh, spot on uh, as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, Danelle. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Asia Society, for putting together this wonderful day. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I also realized that the only thing between you and the cocktail reception and a fabulous panel is me. So I'm going to keep my remarks short and lighthearted. Um, I started Lucky Rice um, 10 years ago as really a platform to unite Asian cultures um, with, uh, well, to, to create broader audiences for Asian cultures through the lens of food. Food is so universal. We all eat. Um, it's so uh, organic to the Chinese lifestyle as well. And I like to say, you know, our mantra at Lucky Rice is if we are what we eat, we're all part Asian. Um, food has a lot of social currency and is a wonderful lens through which to share stories about Asian culture. And so throughout the last 10 years, we've been fortunate to create these platforms where we've united, on the one hand, chefs that are interested in uh, cooking Asian cuisine, whether or not they're um, ethnically Asian, um, the audiences that are interested in exploring food and culture through food, and then finally, the businesses that want to reach out to both of these audiences. Um, this has been a really wonderful journey. We've brought the festival to 10 major markets in the US, and about five years ago, I was approached by CAM, which is the Center for Asian American Media, they are a subsidiary of PBS um, to create and host a show called Lucky Chow. So we're now in our fourth season of producing um, a documentary style, six part um, series about food across America, Asian food in particular. So um, the mission statement is the same, to share stories and to broaden greater awareness of Asian cultures through the lens of food. Um, Lucky Chow is now a nonprofit, and with our festivals, we actually work with the nonprofit to create 
uh, cultural experiences. So I'm about to show you a short film that's actually still in the process of being edited of our most recent exhibit, which is um, a 65-foot rice paddy that I created um, at the World Trade Center um, with the city, the Port Authority. It's been a, many years in, in the making, but we were able to create this long uh, rice paddy in the center of the heart of Manhattan at the Oculus Plaza. And so what I hope that people do when they come across this rice paddy is, you know, to, to bring their amazement and their curiosity and to wonder about the role of rice in our global economies and um, as cultural exchange. I mean, rice is obviously the foundation of Asian food, but it's also a very global um, metaphor. And so a couple of weeks ago, we held our rice feast where we had dozens of chefs from around the world come and create dishes that use rice, be it, um, you know, a Chinese fried rice dish or a uh, Italian uh, arancini. Um, so using food as metaphor is really what I do. Um, love to show you a little film about the rice paddy and the feast. And also to mention that we're going to be doing a public harvest of the rice on the 21st in the morning at the World Trade Center. So if anybody is interested, please join us there with your work boots on. Um, we're also looking for a secondary home for the installation. So if anybody would like to adopt a rice paddy, please come and speak to me. Um, do we have a little short film of it? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. So with Lucky Chow, our nonprofit entity, you know, we're really mostly invested in storytelling and cross-cultural storytelling. So I'd like to show a short clip from season three that's now airing about uh, Dai Jin Zhu. I cannot pronounce his name properly, I'm sorry. But um, he's the, the very, very beloved um, Ade, I call him, from Dragon's Well Manor in Hanzhou. Um, and we filmed with him recently to talk about China's growing global locavore culture and then contrasted it with a farmer here in the North Fork who is also doing something similar but really 
promoting the quality of food that we're eating today. Um, I might cut it a little short just so that we have more time for discussion. So maybe we'll run it for a few minutes or so. And then, um, and then I'd love to hear from the rest of you in terms of you know, to continue this wonderful conversation that we've started. movement has taken root in China, there was one person I knew I had to see, Dai Jingjun, creator and owner of Dragon's Well Manor in Hangzhou. Adai's restaurant only serves food that was grown organically within a few hours drive of the restaurant. Bringing local to an even deeper level, Adai serves dishes that aren't typically seen in restaurants, real home-cooked specialties based on local ingredients. Adai is spearheading the farm-to-table movement in China, bringing what he learned from his travels in Europe back to his home country. Actually, 美在食材。啊，我们现在城市在就城市化进程的过程当中，嗯，我们正在远离着我们的食物，而我们的食物渐渐变成为一种工业化的产物，这是很可悲的。As China becomes more urban and there's less farming, how are you keeping that tradition alive here? 就是说从不在菜市场在马克的里面去买食物而是要到农民这里那么然后你光是路程就很远更何况你这样去买的食物的价格所以我有点大家都说你有点说进球员本末倒置说我但是我觉得他们才是真正的本末倒置就是你说做
A Chinese American family has been supplying high quality Asian produce to the eastern United States for more than 60 years. Sang Lee Farms is now in the forefront of a new era of organic community based agriculture. With a CSA program, a farm stand, a home delivery service, and educational workshops in cooking and plant medicine. But its local roots are deep. Sangley Farms was started somewhere in the early 40s. My uncle John had the idea, well, there's a market in Chinatown, and they're looking for more vegetables and fresh greens. And then my father joined him, and my other uncle joined him. And then they started farming and uh, growing Chinese cabbage for primarily the New York City Chinatown market. I've never been on a farm where there is so much variety. So the baby bok choy, I also see it on your shirt. Is that sort of your signature vegetable? That was our primary crop for many decades. We were one of the largest bok choy growers on the East Coast. Mm. Are those ready to be harvested? They're a little bit young, but they can okay. be harvested for ultra baby bok choy size. And we can cut one if you'd like. What does it mean for you to keep this tradition growing? It's kind of cool. It has been very rewarding. And it's nice to see the younger generation interested in keeping the farm alive. My son, William, wants to continue farming. And that's, that's nice. Anywhere in the world, a farm is a magical place to be. It was truly inspiring to see farms in such different places and cultures all focused on making agriculture sustainable and back to food in its purest form. It's not just a way of life or a way of eating. It's something we all need to survive. <laughs> all right, well, I hope I've stoked, stoked your appetite for both some lively conversation and some cocktails. <laughs> We invite all the speakers for this panel on stage. So uh, this is a very interesting uh, panel because here we really go into the the what we call the soft uh, areas of you know working uh, in culture but particularly working across cultures and dealing with basically you know the encounter between communities and ways of lives and ways of looking at the world uh, that are uh, are uh, inhabited by people and communities that are quite sort of different. So uh, I want to leave slightly more, well, we don't have time, but <laughs> slightly more time for, for at least, you know, one or two uh, questions. So I just want to do a, a kind of round robin thing and just throw just one question to uh, the panelists, which is in your uh, experience, you know, of working across communities and across cultures, and and trying to get people to collaborate across these uh, these these lines. What, in your your opinion, has been the primary, or you know, what you feel is the most sort of urgent obstacle or barrier or, or thing that always it's like, oh no, it's that uh, again. And and how have you sort of tried to deal with that in in your in your in your life and in, in your your profession, uh, and Danielle has just spoken, so I would start from the end. Maybe with Kara. Yeah. Um, I, I, that's a really good question, and I was just reflecting on the wonderful clips that that we saw tonight, um, and thinking about, um, in answer to your question, the lack of understanding, which leads to maybe skepticism. In the worst case, can lead to distru distrust and disrespect is on the one side one of the hardest things. And then the way to deal with it, I think we just saw in, in the beautiful um, rice patty uh, that we saw is, is when you can bring joy and wonder and the common human capacity for joy and wonder and humor into the room and understand how people can communicate across that, no matter what their culture is, 
that joy, wonder, and human, uh, humor is a common um, attribute of people. And so if you, can, if you can somehow access that, even if you don't speak the same language or have the same background, I think that's what, I, that's what your question made me think of. Thank you. Daisy? Um, I totally agree with you. And I would also add that um, in addition to create professional connections, I think that it's also very important to create personal connections. I think that when you open your mind, as you mentioned, and to really treat people like your family members and to really open your door, cook a meal for your colleagues, I think that makes a very strong connection. Sylvia? Yeah, I think from my perspective, again, I would have to say that uh, just be really sensitive about culture, especially when you deal with a lot of brands. In my, my instances in my career, they're trying to launch in, in China. I think we have to be mindful and have respect. That's the most important thing. And, and also be aware and also start learning more as well. I mean, it's very interesting for me because I'm Asian, so I automatically have that kind of radar. So throughout my career, I... I, I, I try to advocate and try to tell other of my creatives to be more sensitive to culture in that sense because it's not what you think what, what it is on the other side of the world. So, so uh, just a, a kind of interesting thing that came into my mind. So what about, I'm sure all of you have been, or a lot of you have been situations working you know, collaboratively when you've been the only person in the room from a particular culture. And I will say, you know, at Asian Society, uh, at, at, in the management meeting, I'm the only Asian from Asia uh, in the room that speaks an Asian language. So uh, it's, it's quite common throughout, uh, I think. So uh, it doesn't that, so that sometimes sort of creates certain different kinds of tensions in, in terms of, of I, I, I want to know if that, in those situations, you know, do you all ever feel that, okay, how far am I going to push this, you know, or, or you know, really? Am... <laughs> I think from my working experience, it's really what, um, like, really struck me is how open, actually, Julia and Steve and Jeff were, and they are, to really listen to what you have to say about your culture, and they are just really... Um, curious and that they like I feel the trust they gave me and other co-producer and other uh, field producers Chinese field, field producers um, is tremendous and that's I think it's really important um, how the people you work with how open they are um, yeah so pick your collaborators carefully I think um. Hmm. I'm not sure if I'm responding to the first question or the second question exactly, but I think um, something that was really important and that didn't really happen a lot in the context of the factory was making, actually making the time to think and talk about culture is so important. Um, when the factory opened, people were really excited because this was all new and these people were really new to each other. But as soon as the management started looking around and saying, well, it's great that you're all excited, but we need to start making money, any attempts at trying to bridge the gap between the cultures went out the window. And we had a luxury on our side because we were the documentary filmmakers. We could come and go. We would film all day and spend evenings with each end talking about China, what it was like to grow up in China. We would take that knowledge back with us into the factory. But you couldn't, they weren't trying to replicate that sort of experience in the factory floor because they were there to make money. And it does take time to build that kind of trust, to build that kind of understanding, and to be able to see somebody as themselves as opposed to just some kind of somebody who's come from another place. I, I suppose um, in that kind of situation, when you are working with somebody of another culture, really it's, it's sort of also a beginning of a learning process, right? Because the reality is you, you have to learn. Both parties have to learn because there are a lot of things you actually, you think you know, but you, you, you actually don't know. And I would say this is not a kind of West versus East thing. It's, it's on, on, on both sides. And, and uh, I remembered when I did a three-year project in France with one of the biggest institutions uh, in Paris, and we were doing an exhibition, and there was a, a exhibition. And, and all the Asians with me were extremely perturbed by one thing, was extremely perturbed like when a visitor dropped a piece of tissue. Nobody, even if the guard was standing next to it, would pick it up. And we were all like, ah, you know, should we? 
you know, a very Asian kind of, mm. yeah, let's just do it. And, and, and you know, well, it's, it's a very simple practical thing because the labour and the union laws are very strict mm. because you would be depriving the person that is actually has a job to do that, of, of that, that sort of job. So we were supposed to call, uh, you know, cleaning uh, services. So it sounds very prosaic, but it, it does create, like, I, I distinctly remembered that because, uh, you know, the Ch I had a group of Chinese and we were all like, you know, <laughs> like, what's going on, yeah. you know? And, and the same thing happened with, like, photocopiers uh, working with, I don't know whether you have done uh, these kinds of, of uh, or you have been in this kind of situations. So, you know, it, of course, we had a meeting with, with the curators on, on uh, late on Friday and we wanted to make a photocopy of our discussion notes and, and very sheepishly the curator said, um, after five o'clock, my, my pin number doesn't work on the photocopier uh -huh. uh, because we're all supposed to go home. I mean, we're not, we're supposed right. to go home, you know, and that it's nothing to be laughed at because it is a kind of cultural value on the part of, of, of our collaborators and just because, you know, we, we, Asians or we Chinese, you know, think nothing of burning and made us realize we have to respect also other right. people's values. It goes both ways. It's not yeah. always, you know, us saying, oh, you know, the yeah. Europeans don't, yeah. don't, don't get us. So that was a, a very sobering. Uh, and we end with Danielle. Yeah, no, I would just add that cultural is extremely personal. And so... The question I get asked probably the most is, what's the most authentic Chinese restaurant in New York? And you note authentic is equated with quality. Um, and that is not necessarily the case. And I've learned so much about Chinese food from, say, my Jewish friends who grew up with their culture of eating Chinese food for Christmas and for Sunday suppers. And I would argue that it's just as authentic to them and their context as it is to mine. Yep. So that's... I want to quickly touch on that as well because it was interesting. Being Singaporean as well, where like I launch a lot of global campaigns, they automatically assume I understand Chinese culture. Actually, I don't. In <laughs> Singapore, we are so westernized. I mean, I would never assume there are no culture in China. That is something that I myself is very sensitive about as well, and that is just really interesting, you know. So, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I wrote. There was a question here that I just wanna. Uh, actually, it's for for Jeff and uh, Yi Qian. Was so in the film? Do you feel that uh, there was a question about? Do you feel that the project was doomed to fail? I mean, the factory <laughs> project because it seemed as if they were creating a kind of bubble world uh, almost that, that, you know, the system versus, it's the individuals, you know, who are trying to go out of, of, of that bubble. But the whole thing, I mean, this kind of, the clip you, you showed, you know, seemed to be a kind of hermetic world strategizing on its own how to deal with the others on the other side of the fence. Well, I guess it depends on how you define success or failure in the context of this endeavor. Um, if we asked Fuya's management right now, is the plan a success? They would say yes, because it is still existing. It's still in profit, and they're planning to expand their base of operations here in the United States because they, they like working here. Um, if you ask the workers who were you know, who were there in that first wave who came in with that hope and optimism, with the excitement about learning about China through their Chinese counterparts, um, most of them who no longer work there, they would say, no, it's an utter failure. The place is unsafe. People have been hurt there. There have been multiple EPA violations. They busted the potential of a union. People are still not getting the wages that they were promised that they were going to get at the beginning. Um, so it's all a matter of perspective. And it's something that, it was complicated for us in the, in the context of the film, and especially for Steve and Julia who live in that community, because on the one hand, it is really great that there is a huge manufacturing facility open again near Dayton, but in the same token, it's paying half what the old manufacturing facility used to pay. So it really depends on, on who you ask about it. Again, you see this cultural divide, and I've been told to end in no uncertain terms by <laughs> the lovely lady down there. So uh, I'd just like to thank our panelists all uh, for, 
for spending their precious time with us and being so open and I think casualness appeared in one PowerPoint today. I think that's very important because that helps, you know, in a sense, uh, it's, it's a kind of hand, open hand, that it, open palm that is extended uh, in friendship and in the hope of collaboration. So uh, I'm sure we, we have time to discuss with our, our panelists uh, in the reception following. So uh, may we have a round of applause for our panelists. And thank you all. It's been a tremendous turnout. And I thank our collaborators, uh, Chi Jiao from the Beijing Contemporary uh, Art Foundation for, again, an incredible uh, sort of uh, event that they've organized to us. And we'd like to invite everybody uh, for drinks upstairs in the cafe. Thank you. <laughs>